John will be uh, speaking to us uh, this morning on a Mennonite view of uh, Pope Francis' visit. John. Thank you, Glenn. You know, when you say a Mennonite view of something, um, then you have to realize that you only have one of all the Mennonites here giving the view. And so if we'd have two, then you'd have a different view. You'd have two views of Mennonites about the, the Pope being here with us. I, I would just say a, f a few words about my connections with, uh, as I was growing up with the, with the Catholic Church, relationship to the Mennonite Church. We, when you're in a Mennonite community, you're really quite isolated from what other people are doing, even other Protestant denominations. We're pretty much to ourselves ingrown within our communities. And so my, my early childhood experience was with a mission station in eastern Pennsylvania. And if we talked about Catholics at that time as Mennonites, we would usually talk about it in terms that we would maybe help them to understand who Christ was. So it, they were the subject of evangelism. And uh, that was my early experience with Catholics in the Mennonite Church. It's an interesting thing, though. My mother became the president of the, 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 um, the school parent teachers association. And in the school where we were in Trooper, there were quite a few Catholics. And so that brought the Catholic community sort of into our home at that point. And my mother had a, an altogether different view about it than what many other people had. In fact, she was very open and very receptive. Uh, I, if you're around me for very long and hear about my mother, why she was an exceptional person in many ways. She was open and broad to those things, and so she accepted them. But you need to understand that she had very much the trappings of being a Mennonite. Now, when I say that, I mean she wore a covering and a cape dress. Um, in fact, sometimes I was a bit embarrassed about that. It took a little cultural bringing me was we lived in the, and you go to the town and you, your mother looked different. And so that, that was part of my early experience. Well, then, then we came in, in our married life together, and we were pastors of a church. And uh, John F. Kennedy was running for president. How many of you remember that? And the mythology was, you tell me, what was the mythology among Mennonites about John F. Kennedy? Did you hear that? The Pope would take over the church and we would not have freedom of worship. Now, can you believe that? And I think that that feeling was pretty universal. And he was running against whom? Do you remember? Nixon. And what was Nixon's religion? Quaker. So if you were a, a good Mennonite, of course, Nixon would be the answer to the election. Would, would you, Mennonites here, would you, do you remember that? Is that part of your, your history? Well, then, then this third level for this is that we moved to Northern Ireland. Now, part of the problem in Northern Ireland was it was two big families that lived there in the British, in this United Kingdom community in Northern Ireland. In fact, the revolution in the South that created the Northern Ireland boundaries, the borders were gerrymandered so that majority Protestants would remain in the north and the Catholics would be south. And so the border around Northern Ireland does, isn't a straight line. It winds around towns and villages all the way around so that you would keep the majority in the north as Protestants. And then what happened is that the United Kingdom from London really had the political control over Northern Ireland and consequently the policemen with a population of about, let's say, uh, close to 60% Protestant and 40% Catholic, but all of the police people, they were called the RUC at that time, were Protestant. And they were then policing Catholic communities. And here's this um, 
Mennonite couple coming into Northern Ireland in the midst of all the troubles. We, we lived right on the wall. And when I say the wall, there was, all, there was not just the wall. There were about 26 walls in Belfast that would divide communities. That was their solution of how to keep the Catholics and the Protestants separate, is you'd build a big wall. Did you see the height of the ceiling here? The wall around our house was just about that high. And our assignment was to work with the police. Now, see, look at the, um, the dissidents that we have to have and when you're talking about this assignment. We're, we're pacifists. We, we would not even think as Mennonites that you should have an occupation that would cause you to carry a gun. And my assignment was that I would work with the RUC. Now, the reason we'd work with them is that you try to help them to understand the Catholic community in which they are policing. Now, that's quite an assignment. But that was the assignment our office, called Mediation Network for Northern Ireland, took on. And we began working with the police. We soon discovered, though, that you, um, you didn't work with the policemen that were there for like 25 or 30 years. You weren't going to change them. And so we began only working with the recruits, the new ones coming on. And so we were part of the orientation for the police in Northern Ireland for those, day, those years that we were there. It was a challenging and wonderful experience. We, this is a, another little demonstration about it. We attended, and since we were working with cross-community, when I say cross-community in Ireland, you worked with both Catholics and Protestants. They were separated in all of these areas. Schools, the Catholic children went to their schools, and the Protestant children went to their schools. They were separated as far as churches are concerned, of course. In fact, they wouldn't even go into each other's church or chapels, as they're called, the Catholics ones, and the church for the Protestants. They were separated as far as where they lived. And when those communities came up against each other, then they built a wall between them. And so there are big high walls all around the city dividing the two communities. One night, uh, our, our particular wall, the, the gate was locked at, eight, at, at, not, at 10 o'clock at night, and it was open the next morning at 6, and we were down at the monastery nearby, and the, the, it was a political meeting where their political parties were talking about the troubles. We were there in the midst of the troubles, and we came about 10 minutes late, and we couldn't get through our wall. The gate was locked. Now, there were some Catholic sisters that lived on the wall, which was interesting, and they would open their front door and let us in the front door and walk through their kitchen out the back door to get to our house. And that was the way we could get into our home after the gate was locked. That particular night, our, our sisters were not there. And so I went, it was about a mile and a half around, and it was a rainy night, like Ireland has mostly rainy nights, to get into our house. It would have been taken about a, another hour to walk around there in the rain. And so I went down to the taxi station just about a quarter of a mile away from our gate on the Catholic side. And I said to the driver, I, I, I need to go to Workman Avenue, and the gate's locked. Would you take me over there? He said, uh, I've never been there. A distance not more than over to where the dormitory is to here. He had never been in that area behind the wall. I said, well, I can show you how to go. And he said, well, is it safe for me to go? Well, I can't guarantee it, but I think so. And so he drove us for the first time in Workman Avenue to our house. Now, that's what a divided community looks like when people begin to have suspicions about each other. And, they, um, and it turns into violence. That's what, precisely what happened in Northern Ireland. And, and the violence was sometimes very acute. Well, my particular assignment now is to talk to you about how did this Mennonite feel about having the Pope here with us for these days. Let, let me just, I'm going to quickly go through here. I'm not going to read them all to you because you can read them yourself. This is, a, I, I have several of these times. I don't, I don't think you can read down below, but those are the sayings of Pope Francis there below. Uh, this is sort of the outline. The meaning of the visit for Mennonites 
and the gratefulness of the Catholic, Catholic neighbors. I'm just, I'll go on and talk about that. The meaning for Mennonites. I, I think that, that the new day has arrived and we are, um, are not as tight and not as negative in feelings about other communities, not only here at home, but around the world. And that's certainly true of, of our feelings about Catholics. Uh, we have almost completely changed our mind about a lot of things. And I think that one of the nice things about having Pope Francis here for that, that extended weekend is that it gave us a view of the humanity and the graciousness of this Pope that we have right now. I, in part of our travels with True Imagination through the years, we, one, one of our trips to Rome, we have a number of trips to Rome, I had the privilege of being in St. Peter's when the Pope arrived in there. And I, I, I sensed at that time, in fact, I'm not quite sure which Pope it was at this point. It was quite a few years ago. I think it was Pius. I'm not sure. And, and when he came in, there was a hush in it all in St. Peter's where the presence of the Pope there in that room. I, th these are some of the things that Mennonites, as we search for spirituality, and you're going, in the second hour you'll hear more about this kind of thing, but these are some of the things I think that, that, that come to my mind that, that we, we, I think that we covet a bit, as Mennonites, a bit more of the mysticalness of religion, uh, the transcendence. That, that part, I think, is, is sort of missing when we get together to worship. Uh, if you go to a Mennonite worship service, it, sometimes it, it, it seems far from a, a, myst, a mystical kind of religion at all. Uh, and I think that these, these things are some of the ways in which we search for spirituality. I'm not going to talk about that much. Then how Mennonites put this together is that we, I think we have a lost sense of our mysticism and we are more committed to a living faith. Uh, let, let me just divert just a bit and say a word about this, is that I think that there are two different kinds of, of facts or understandings. One is that uh, you can have thing knowledge. In other words, I, I have this microphone in front of me. I don't have to have faith that I have this microphone. And that, that's a thing. I can see it. A, a podium. You. The chairs. Then there is the other side, and that's sort of the mystical side of it. And that's, that's faith knowledge. For example, we all need oxygen to breathe. How do you know there's oxygen in this room? Well, you have faith to believe that it's here, don't you? You must. I stood at the marriage altar to that, with that young, beautiful bride 62 years ago, and her father said to us, I pronounce you husband and wife. Now, um, were we? Faith knowledge said, yes, we were married. We left that church as husband and wife. And there's something mystical about that. Something very mystical about that. Something transcendent about that. And that belief has continued on to this very day. I was, I was ordained in the ministry. It's interesting. See, I'm, I'm the youngest of four children. And my brother Paul was the oldest. He died, by the way, about 18 months ago. He was the oldest. And he was ordained when he was 18 years old. And he was ordained by the lot. How many of you here know what I mean when I talk about the lot? It, it's a New Testament concept, the early church. Thaddeus was elected to take the place of Judas, and they chose by lot. Now, my contention is about that. That's a very mystical thing. When the congregation chooses somebody to be on the lot, and then they sit there in almost awe after prayer, and the people one by one go and pick up the songbooks in the front of the, of the, of the pulpit there, and when finally the book is opened and one of them has the slip, and he's chosen, and for the rest, it changes that person for the rest of their life.
Now see, as long as our congregations believed in the mystical value of the lot, it worked. And when the generations come along, and see, my brother Paul, the oldest, I was never ordained with the lot. By then, seminaries became an appropriate thing to go to. And out of seminaries, you had now new skills. And so congregations chose people. And then the congregation voted upon it. And then the people came in. When I, when I first moved to Oregon and accepted a pastor in Oregon, the older bishop was not in favor of having a pastor being supported. And when he announced to me the first, Monday, the first day we were there, on the Sunday morning, he said, the hireling will now preach. The hireling will now preach. It was his resistance against the change. That now you were doing something different. Do You see, there was something about us that we also like to have something that is mystical and is transcendent. And when you just vote upon it, it doesn't seem quite the same. And I think now having Pope Francis with us, it, it helped the church to see that here is this person that is the vicar of Christ to a whole host of people that still, in a very real sense, believe that's precisely what he is. And this one that we watched was so gracious about everything in everything that he did. I, I'm going to show you a, a bit more about that. In fact, that's on your paper there. But th those are the kinds of things that we're searching for spirituality. Now, the Catholic Church went through a rather difficult years over these past years with the, viola the violation of persons in the priesthood, of, of parishioners and children. And those were dark years. To have the Bishop of Rome is a gift, I think, not only to us as Protestants, but it was a gift to the Catholic community to see this man who is in almost every way humble and gracious and loving. And then to see also, which we don't often get to see because we don't attend Mass like that, that you have a big public mass in Philadelphia, it was over a million people. And the emblems were served to as many of that million as they wanted. And we could watch, in a very real sense, what happened to that. And I think that was a gift to us also. A gift to the Catholics and a gift to us. He, is, he was when he was here, and he is. Uh, there's a whole site on, on the web, if you put, write, type in his name, and it showed some of the people that he graciously dealt with during his time. Deformed figures, children with great deformities, reaching down and holding them and kissing them. And the morning before you had that Mass, where in the mind of the people there that still believe that that bread and wine is the body and blood of Christ. That morning before, he went to a prison in Philadelphia. And I watched it. I watched it with, with much interest early that Saturday, Sunday morning, walking down the rows of these prisoners sitting there, touching them, leaning down and touching his forehead to their foreheads and whispering something to them, and talking to them, and reaching out to them, one by one by one. And then the next scene, where he enters the great area there in Philadelphia, and holds up the hose, and the bell rings. And the people who believe know that now it has turned into the body and blood of Christ. You see, we, we come out of an enlightenment period, and, and everything is sort of thing knowledge for us. And it does us good, frankly, to see the mystical and recognize 
that it's still important. And may it also in places, maybe that's what we're searching for, also as, as a Mennonite denomination. Where does the mystical fit into our lives? And how does it fit in? Just, just to briefly say that during my ministry, I went through periods of time when I had to stand up and, and deal with things like this. For an example, we, we went through a great revival period, tent meetings and being born again, all that went with that. You remember that. It was here in, 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 uh, in the, our very town. And then we went through a period of a charismatic movement where you weren't really spiritual unless you spoke in tongues. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Glenn and Jeff talked about that yesterday, about their, some of the priests up at the Abbey. It also affected the Catholic Church at that point. And then we went through a period where we were searching more with, um, I, I called it the faith, uh, faith at Work movement, where you began sharing your stories with people and walking in the light with people and having more openness and more community. All of those were ways of searching for spirituality. And I, I think that's going on with us as Mennonites. Um, we are also, I think, on, on that same kind of journey. There I talked about last Sunday. I, I looked at the difference between these two, and I think this takes it in the political world. We must resolve now to live as nobly and justly as possible. We educate new generations not to turn their backs upon our neighbors and everything around us, and especially the immigration. Then look at the bottom one. We built a great wall on our southern border. Make Mexico pay for the wall. Mark my word. Our life in Northern Ireland, I talked about that earlier. I'll hasten on. Observation with pro has given a renewed appreciation for the church universal. A challenge to view the church and their leader as an important part of life and not as people so different from us. We're, we're all on the same kind of journey. Different expressions, but the journey is similar. Understanding the, of the common and preferred for the poor. Uh, that's sort of who we are. Now, I, I laid a paper on your, uh, on your seats there that just let me say a word about that. Look at the Catholic side. What do Catholics believe? This comes from the United States Conference of, of Catholic Bishops, and it, it's, it's a large document. I just summarized it now with these. There's the two sides. One is much more the praxis, what you see, and the other is the sacramental, and that's the mystical, the outside. And on, on, what, on the social teachings are very, very similar to where we are. There's not much difference in that. Now, on the other side, on the sacrament side, we have all of those sacraments also. Our understanding about them is a bit different, but the functions are about the same. It's not that much different that way. I thought about that so often in, in Northern Ireland when um, we were uh, worshiping at the monastery chapel on Sunday morning, the first hour. And then we'd walk back through the wall and, and go to a Methodist church for the second hour. Um, it's, it's interesting. We, we, um, when we left um, the monastery at the chapel there on Sunday morning, it was usually pretty full, families and children. And when we left, we didn't talk to anybody. Everybody left, and we walked out, and sort of a, a, a sense of awe as you left the chapel. And we didn't visit at all. Walked down the street to the Methodist church, and there we had the service. And when it was over, everyone stood around and talked. Visited and talked about what's happening, where the troubles were during the week, and what was going on. But we lived, Belfast is built on a hill, and it goes down to the Belfast Harbor. And our office was right near the, the, the lock, down the harbor. And so I'd walk down that hill. We'd take the bus home. It's a pretty hard walk going home. But during the day, we'd walk down in the morning. And, at, and we walked down on the Falls Road, which is the Catholic road. By the way, the Catholic, the roads were even changed. The Shankle was all Protestant, and the Falls Road was all Catholic. And we walked down on the Falls Road, down to our, our, our office. It, it's the big shopping area in the Falls Road when we passed them. It wouldn't be uncommon on Monday morning 
to walk by somebody and he'd say to me as I walked by, saw your mass yesterday. Saw your mass yesterday. We never visited after the mass, but they knew we were there. And they made comment about it. See, the communion was different. But the dynamic was the same. I, I'm going on, my time is almost up. And I want to I say, maybe this is my final dreams. Maybe, just maybe. And I, I, I say these things carefully, but just maybe, the Pope will begin the journey of total inclusion of women in all aspects of the church life. I think the fact of it is, as far as the Catholic Church is concerned, they're highly dependent upon the sisters and the nuns. And I, I thought when I saw the, uh, I think especially the one in Washington, D.C., where the whole building was full of men. All the bishops had gathered. No women. I hope that maybe he was clear that women are also an important part of the church. Maybe that will change. Just maybe this pope will begin to open the Lord's table to all. I don't know. I would hope that maybe that could happen. But now let me say about ourselves. Our own denomination has had a history of what we call closed communion. We grew up with that. And I, I'm very thankful that in the Mennonite Church, that's beginning to change. I still think it ought to change more. I think we ought to be very overt about this and saying, this is not our table. This is the Lord's table. And everybody is welcome. Maybe, just maybe, this pope, pope will join the historic peace churches in bringing an end to the idea of just war. Now, that quote I have under there in red, he said, conscience objection must enter into every judicial structure because it is right, said Francis. Along with many others, we as Mennonites are grateful for all that he has done through his humility and grace and loving kindness to all. I think that we've had an example of Pope Francis of, of a Christ-like figure that moved among us for these days and for which I am very, very grateful. Do you ever look at this little cartoon? McDowell is, um, is quite a religious man. And it's, it's this... Um, this was in the Sunday paper. Because all creatures are connected, each must be cherished and loved with a respect for all of us as living creatures are dependent on one another. And I'd like to suggest that's not only just the creatures, but also in the human race. We are dependent upon each other. And he has made it very clear. I think that the big giant step forward will be how we relate to other religions in the world. And that's maybe, a that's maybe a jump that our children are going to have to deal with much more than we will.